Um, that is a little loud. All right. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, this morning. Let me uh, open us in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we, we consider this morning how good it is for your people to gather together in unity and the thing that unites us together from whatever backgrounds we come from, whatever walks of life, whatever struggles, the thing that unites us together is your love, your calling, your purpose that you've displayed in our lives so that we in our hearts want to seek you. Uh, we want to glorify you. We want to know you. Uh, and so we, we pray this morning in response to all of your mercy that we would worship you acceptably. We pray that you would meet with us today and work mightily in us by your Holy Spirit. Um, help us, Father, to give us a deeper knowledge of you, but not just a knowledge, but um, a deeper walk, a faithfulness uh, to put what we know into action, to have it affect our hearts. Uh, this is the work of your Holy Spirit, and so we pray for your help this morning in your name. Amen. Okay, um, well last week, uh, if you remember, I was away, and uh, so we, I, we did a, a video class, and because we did a video class, we got a little out of sequence. Um, I wanted us to, to cover one last main idea and title of Jesus appearing in the Old Testament, but I wanted to be here in person for it. And so last week we, we moved on to some of the connections that the New Testament begins to make to the Old Testament. Um, but I, I want us to go kind of backtrack this morning and look at one last thing from the Old Testament. And it brings together actually a number of threads we're going to see. Having said that, I want us to start in the New Testament in Matthew 22. So would you take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 22. <clears throat> Very end of the chapter, Jesus is in a conversation with the Pharisees, <clears throat> and in verse 41, it says, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, or until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. Uh, I want to talk today about the idea of the son in the Old Testament. Uh, but I begin here because I want us to think about what Jesus was asking the Pharisees. Why does he ask the question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? What, what does that question imply? What is it looking for, do you think? His okay, his deity, Gina? Okay. They know that the Christ might be called a son. What does that actually mean? Um, what may, may not be completely obvious is that there were actually different conceptions among the Jews about the nature of the Messiah and what they were expecting. The, the word Messiah just means literally an anointed one. And in the Old Testament, there were, there were many different kinds of anointed ones. There were prophets and priests and kings who were all anointed. And there were different, out of that, different messianic expectations and ideas about what kind of Messiah they could expect. Um, 
In, in fact, some, some of the Jews wondered whether there might be multiple messiahs that were coming. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, you, one of the things we, we don't also understand is that the, these different parties, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, there were Essenes, there were you know, kind of radical groups. They, they, these all had political aspirations. The Pharisees particularly favored the idea of a political Messiah in the promised Davidic king. They wanted a restoration of the monarchy. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were the priestly party. They actually didn't favor the idea of a restoration of the monarchy. They, they actually thought that the priests should be in charge. They wanted a restoration of something prior to the kingship. Um, and they actually favored the idea of a priestly Messiah coming. And the and then there were like groups like the Essenes who were more radicals and they favored the idea of a supernatural Messiah coming, some type of angelic figure. So where, where did the Pharisees get the idea that the Messiah might be a son of David? What were they thinking about? Mary Jo. Okay. And they didn't believe because they knew from Isaiah that the king was born in He could not fulfill the expectations that they had. And they preferred to emphasize verses from the Old Testament that promised that one of David's descendants would one day rise up and be king, you know, for, king over the throne, would restore the Davidic kingdom. And you see, you have these promises in the Old Testament that a descendant from David would sit on the throne. Um, and, and they thought, there's no way this guy can fulfill that. What is the point? Yes, Gina. Um, to some degree, are we at the point where the questions are more about trying to trip them up and they're, <clears throat> they're so confident and haughty in their own knowledge that they are asking these questions, well, then, who's son of the Messiah? But, and then the answer kind of shuts them up because it's over their head. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're definitely asking him questions, trying to trip him up. And this is actually a case where I think he's asking them a question to trip them up. Right. So, so what, what is the point of Jesus' answer to them? What does Jesus say in, in response? Matt. Limited. Again? Limited. Right, and he does the same thing with the Sadducees too when they give him that whole spiel about, um, you know, there's this woman who had seven husbands or whatever, and then they're wrong because the, their conception is very, very limited of, of everything, really. Yeah. So what Jesus does, he takes them to <clears throat> a different idea from the Old Testament. <clears throat> and he quotes Psalm 110 to them. It's interesting, Psalm 110 is probably among the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. And it's a psalm of David where David says, kind of in, in, in a vision, says, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And he goes on and talks about the, him ruling over his enemies as a king, but also later on in the same psalm, he says he's, he's going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So there's this kingly priest coming. And he's described as sitting at the right hand of God and being superior to David. And so his question is, how can he be a son of David, just a son of David, if he's also described as being superior to David and having a superior rule? Now, turn over to Mark 14. <clears throat> 
Mark 14, down in verse 53, this is Jesus' trial uh, the night before his death, his trial before the Sanhedrin. And um, you'll notice down, look down in verse 55, it says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, <clears throat> but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. What, what do you think the high priest is asking in verse 61. Why is he asking it? Nate. Is he kind of connecting it to his conception of what the Messiah was supposed to be, the, the, um, the anointed one and the son? Okay. Yeah. Yes, he's absolutely trying to get him to incriminate himself. By asking, what kind of Messiah are you claiming to be? Are you claiming to be the Christ, the Son of God? Not just David's son, but a divine son, Clark. I think absolutely. Um, are you claiming to be the son of the blessed, the son of the blessed God, or the son of the living God? Um, because that's quite a claim. Um, what is significant about Jesus' answer? He says, yes. He says, I am, ego e me, and then what does he say? He claims the Son of Man title. Son of Man title from Daniel, seven. Daniel chapter 7. Who will come on the clouds of heaven and be presented to the Ancient of Days and be given an eternal kingdom. Um, why are they so incensed as to condemn him to death? Because they, they know what he's claiming. Um, so here's what I, what I want us to think about this morning. Where would the idea of, this idea of a son of God have come from in the Old Testament, not just a son of David, but also a supernatural Messiah? Where would we see evidence of God having a unique supernatural son? And and in one sense, if, you, if you've been with us in this entire course, where we've seen this in the Old Testament, this person who is called Yahweh, sent from Yahweh, who is also called the Word of God, the name of God, the glory of God, the face of God, the hand that comes from God, all of those titles imply a unique person emanating from God and even the idea of a, of a son. Now let, let's turn back to the verse that Jesus referenced to the high priest. Let's turn back to Daniel chapter seven. <clears throat> Daniel seven, starting in verse nine. 
This is the middle of a vision that Daniel has, or really the, kind of the climax of a vision Daniel has. Daniel 7, verse 9, he says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and get over, given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. All right, so this is only part of a, of a larger vision that, that Daniel has. And to understand it, we actually really need to understand the larger vision and the historical context of the vision. I didn't want to read it all because that would take too long. Um, but if you look back at chapter 7, verse 1, this vision came to Daniel during the first year of the reign of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Um, and Belshazzar, here's... Belshazzar was actually, we, we know, the, the, a co-regent with his father, Nabonidus, who was kind of the last official king of Babylon. Um, and yet Nabonidus spent his final years in seclusion and gave over control of the kingdom to his son, Belshazzar. And Belshazzar turned out to be a pretty corrupt and foolish ruler, and Babylon quickly slides into corruption and wickedness, and, and Daniel is, you know, kind of watching all this happen, and in this context, he's given this vision of future conflicts and kingdoms, and the climax is this son of man figure coming and being given an eternal kingdom, and, and it, it looks a lot like a son of being given a co-regency from his father, like Nabonidus and Belshazzar. But, but instead of it being a sign of corruption and wickedness, it's a sign of glory and salvation. And it's almost like God is deliberately using the historical context of the co-regency of Belshazzar as a, a contrast to his future Messiah and Daniel is being comforted in this vision that God's plan and purpose is still being worked out and God's people will triumph through the kingdom of the Messiah. Okay, that's the historical context. Matt. Just real quick side note, it's, it's interesting that you mention that because I think Jesus, <coughs> one of his parables, I think it's the one with the, um, the wicked tenants or whatever, uses a current political thing that something with Herod or something like that does the exact same thing that was happening with this Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar thing. I just, it, that's really interesting that he, yeah. even in telling the parables, he's doing the exact same thing that the prophecies that were given to Daniel are doing in his time. Now, it, it gets more interesting. Because oh. now there's the vision itself. And at the beginning of the vision, Daniel sees the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea and beasts coming out of the sea. Does anybody know what would have been significant about those elements beginning this vision? Those, those would have been very familiar images. Uh, the four winds of heaven, the great sea, beasts coming out of the sea, all of those are images you can find in ancient pagan creation myths. Like the Babylonian Enuma Elish, or the, the Baal cycle of the Canaanites. And, and each of those myths of the ancient world involves a war between the gods. 
Um, the, the great sea represented like the primordial waters of creation, waters of chaos out of which everything came. And, and in those cre- original creation myths, there was a, an original God figure who the other gods rebel against. And their champion, either Marduk or Baal, depending on the story, de- defeats the monster of the sea and then sets himself up as the, as the new high god in charge. And so by bringing up these images, it, it's like God is giving Daniel a dream that is a counter image. A multi-layered um, argument against the stories of the pagan world. They, they're fighting out these battles one after another, having dominion for a time, until one last one rises up boasting great things. And while that last one is in the midst of boasting great things, Daniel's vision is opened up wider and he has a vision of the heavenly court and this council room of God and the judgment of God where this last beast is still speaking and is suddenly destroyed and then comes a figure of a son of man, a human figure, but riding on the clouds of heaven. Does anybody know the significance of him riding on the clouds of heaven. That's what Baal did. Or it's what Marduk did. In Babylonian and Canaanite religion, Marduk and Baal were both described as cloud riders. They were the gods of the storm. And in the Baal epic, after defeating the beast of the sea, Baal comes to El and demands to be the highest of the gods. And a similar thing happens in the story of Marduk. Now in the Bible, who rides the clouds? Who who appears in the cloud that we've seen in the last several weeks? In in the Bible, it's always Yahweh riding the clouds of heaven. You know, one example, Psalm 104 says, Yahweh, my God, you are very great. You clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as a garment. You make the clouds your chariot and ride on the wings of the wind. And so these these were God images, and yet here is a son of man riding on the clouds of heaven, coming before the Ancient of Days, and not where he demands a kingdom, but a kingdom is given to him everlastingly to rule, and he is worshiped. The the word serve there um, in... Uh, verse 14, that all people's nations and languages should serve him. That's, that's a worship word. They're worshiping him. Um, Clark, you had a hand up. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we're being given here a, a vision that is deliberately rejecting the, the stories of the world and saying, this is what's really happening. Higher than your imaginations, higher than what your wishes are, here's what's gonna go on in the heavenly realm and here's what God is promising for the future. Um, now look down at, at Daniel 8. We'll, we'll stay in Daniel a little bit longer. In Daniel 8, Daniel has another vision of animals on the rampage that represent kingdoms to come. The, the, the kingdoms are somewhat different than the kingdoms of chapter seven. It's a little bit of a different vision. Um, but some of the images are similar and the, this vision also kind of comes to a head with a little horn who grows exceedingly great and does terrible things. Look at chapter eight, verse nine. Uh, one of, out of one of them, the horns of the goat came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of the transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. 
Um, and then it goes on. We, we know from history uh, that this was a prophecy about the coming Greek Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, and he became a famous persecutor of the Jews. And in 170 AD, he invaded, invaded Jerusalem. He slaughtered 80,000 people. And he plundered the temple and rededicated the temple to Zeus. Um, and yet in this vision, this is pictured as a spiritual war happening on a heavenly plane. The, the host of heaven and the stars were terms associated with angels and archangels. And so in this, in this vision, it's like Antiochus Epiphanes is like an avatar of a spiritual enemy of God's people. His name Epiphanes means God made manifest. This was what he was claiming. And so even his name you know, shows the spiritual aspect of this war that's going on. And the key verse is verse 11, that this horn became great, even as great as the prince of the host. Where, where have we seen that term before? Anybody remember? Joshua 5, uh, where Joshua, before the battle of Jericho, sees this man with a drawn sword who calls himself the commander of the army of the Lord, a commander of the host of the Lord, or it could be translated prince of the host. And it's, it's the only two times that phrase appears in the Old Testament. Um, and so here, this horn is said to really be rebelling against the prince of the host. Uh, and the prince of the host is described as the, as the lord of the temple. Because he goes on, he says, the regular burnt offering was taken away from him and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown, that the prince of the host was the one dwelling in the sanctuary. Now, later on in the chapter, the angel Gabriel explains the, the vision down to verse 23 Chapter 8, verse 23, he says, At the latter end of the kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall, shall, shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The, vi the vision of the evenings and the mornings has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. So here he says he's rebelling against the prince of princes. What do you, what do you think prince of princes means? Okay. Okay. The prince of princes, the king of kings. Now, what it's saying is there's a, there's there's multiple principalities out there, but there is one above and beyond all the others. And so it's talking about supernatural beings. Um, now this gets us into territory that is a little weird. Uh, if you didn't think all those visions were weird anyway. Um, and it's something that's not talked about very often. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, it brings up the idea of the divine council and the sons of God. Um, numerous places in the Old Testament, uh, there are angelic beings, sometimes called sons of God. You think about the book of Job. Uh, the book of Job begins with the sons of God coming to present themselves before the Lord. Uh, later in Job, it talks about 
the sons of God shouting for joy at creation. Um, Daniel, you'll notice back in Daniel 7, verse uh, 9, it talks about thrones being placed and the Ancient of Days taking his seat at the head of a heavenly courtroom of thrones. And this idea of God having a, a council of angelic beings appears numerous places in the Bible. Um, the Bible even pictures God giving over regions of the world, nations, to the control of the sons of God. Um, some of whom it turns out were, were wicked deceivers. So what I want us to think about is where do we, where do we put all this in terms of how Jesus relates to these other supernatural beings? What does it mean that he's the prince of princes? What is the relationship between the son of God and the sons of God? Uh, does that just mean that he's just one being just like all the other beings? Or is it something more? And I don't want to go too far down. This We could actually spend several weeks on just on this subject, and I'm going to risk going down this rabbit trail. Um, but Deuteronomy 32 um, is a very interesting verse. Deuteronomy 32, verse 7 says, Remember the days of old, consider the years... This is verse seven. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you when the most high gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance or allotted heritage. Um, uh, there's another verse Deuteronomy 4.19 says, Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But God has allotted to you himself. Um, so what Deuteronomy 32 is describing is God kind of giving over the nations to the worship of other gods, but the Lord taking Israel as his special inheritance. Um, you, you could actually argue, now this, this is a little freaky, but you could actually argue that in verse eight and nine, you have the most high, you have the sons of God, and then you have Yahweh, who is one of the sons of God, but also the Most High himself. Um, the point is, even though there are multiple gods, multiple beings called sons of God, the Bible says, seems to imply that there is one who's unique. One preeminent above all the rest, one who sits at the head of the heavenly court, who is co-regent with the Father because he was in the beginning with the Father. He was always there. The, the Father has always had a unique son, an only begotten son. And so you, in the Old Testament, you start to see an emphasis on the only begotten or the unique. Um, you know, Abraham didn't have just one son but there was only one unique son. Um, there, there, were, there were sons of God that were called sons of God, but they were created. But there was also an eternally begotten son um, who was unlike all the others. Um, that's as far down that trail as I want to go. Um, Matt. Sadducees, they wouldn't have believed any of that. Is that right? But at the time of Jesus' time? 
yeah, the Pharisees were not super, or the Sadducees were not supernaturalists. Um, but would the Pharisees have <clears throat> believed all of this and then been upset because Jesus was claiming to be that anointed son? Yeah, and the, and the Pharisees would, would have wrestled with those kinds of things. It was, there were actually other groups, like the Essenes. The Essenes really emphasized these supernatural passages. The Pharisees really wanted the political Messiah, but they would have been wrestling with, they, they knew that there were these passages suggesting a supernatural Messiah, and they're, they're, they're defi- they all definitely get angry that Jesus claims to be that. Um, and that would be partly, there's probably partly that. It was also partly because they, they tried to interpret those verses very differently and wanted to protect God and God alone. And yet you're claiming to be somebody with a unique relationship with God from eternity. That's blasphemy. Um, now, so what I want us to explore a little bit just for the time we have left is this idea of a unique son of God. Um, so Psalm 2, very familiar psalm. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's the word Messiah, saying... Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then a different person starts to speak. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, This is obviously a, uh, this is the second psalm. Uh, People have argued that the first two psalms are like the introduction to the psalms. First psalm is about the importance of the law. The second psalm is about the importance of the Messiah. Um, And there's a a promise here of a king coming. And of course they would connect this to a Davidic king. But some of this language also suggests something that is more ultimate than just a human king. Um, some of the language is, is somebody saying, I received, let me tell you about the decree. I heard the decree of God. And the decree of God is, you are my son. Today I have begotten you, and I will make the ends of the earth your possession. Not just Israel, but one day all the nations will be reclaimed for you. Um, Therefore, serve the Lord, kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Um, There's this idea of of an anointed son who is going to be the king, but who heard the decree from the beginning. Um, here's Here's another Psalm, Psalm 89. Uh, Psalm 89 is a song about God's covenant promises to David. But it also contains a lot about the heavenly beings and the heavenly realm. So Psalm 89 verse, verse five says, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, the the phrase there is literally, who among the sons of God is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones 
and awesome above all who are around him. Um, you know, some people get into like a debate about polytheism and monotheism and things like that. And some people say, well, you know, the, the Jews were, you know, it's, at times the Jews were polytheistic. So the question is, what do you actually mean? Um, are there more gods than one? Well, yes and no. There are all kinds of people who claim, all kinds of beings who claim to be gods, but there is one who is the real God, who's the most high God, who's above all others, who, who created all things, and no one else can compare to him. Um, there, are, there are councils in heaven, ways that, you know, there are beings carrying out eternal purposes, but there is one who is above them all. Now, later on in Psalm 89, it starts to get into um, a different thing. He says, of old, you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Um, so here, here's this, this promise to David, but it's a vision that was from of old, spoken to one who was, who was coming, who will call him father, and who would be the firstborn. The, the firstborn is the, you know, the one who receives the inheritance rights. Um, the, the highest of the kings of the earth, or as Revelation says, king of kings and lord of lords. <clears throat> Micah chapter five, very familiar verse from, we read at Christmas. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the, tri the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days, or from, you could actually translate, from times eternal. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when he who is in, she who is in labor is given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Um, there's so much there, obviously prophecy about a coming Davidic king, but it also says his coming forth, uh, I actually think the, the, the word there for coming forth is actually a plural his comings forth are from of old. Uh, I actually think it's implying he's been coming forth all along from ancient days, from times eternal. Um, and he shall have the strength of the Lord and he shall bear the majesty of the name of the Lord. Um, pretty amazing connections. Uh, then you get to Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It means God with us. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of government and of his peace, there'll be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There's a son coming, a child. And this child is unlike any other. He's, he's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. And he receives the throne of David. Um, last week in Proverbs 30, I mentioned Proverbs 30, verse 4, uh, who has ascended to heaven and come down 
who has gathered the wind in his fists, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment, who has established the ends of the earth, what is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. So you put all this together and and you start to have a pretty comprehensive picture of a son in the Old Testament. And, And what they were arguing about in the New Testament. When Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees or with the Sadducees or with the chief priests, and they're saying, what are you really claiming? The Jews knew all these things. They didn't quite know how to put it together. That's why they disagreed with one another. And then they got Jesus coming along and saying, well, actually, they all fit together. And I'm him. And you see why they were getting so mad. These are pretty remarkable claims. Um, John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side, he has made him known. The word word only God there is monogenes theos. It's the, the one and only God. Sometimes translated the only begotten God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Or most famously, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his monogenes son, um, his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be, might be saved through him. <clears throat> uh, God has a son unlike any other. He's the son who was eternally with the father, who claims to be the same as the father, speak in the name and the authority of the father. And he's the one who's finally come to receive a kingdom. God gives his son to the world in love for the world. Fairer is he than all the fair that fill the heavenly train. Um, Psalm Psalm 45 is a a psalm to the king. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I will address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. In your splendor and majesty, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond all your companions. Who who were his companions? You could start to go through all these different verses and say, well, it's it's all these other sons of God. But then there's this God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you beyond all of them. Um, Gird your your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, and your splendor and your majesty. Fairer is he than all the fair that fill the heavenly train. All right, we have five minutes left. What questions do you have? Are you going to publish this? <laughs> um, I kind of have. <laughs> um, when do we get our copies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Um, we can be done a little early. So next week will be our last uh, uh, last session of the course, and we're gonna look at some more, uh, specifically at the New Testament, and where the New Testament is starting to, is trying to make some of these connections uh, to the Old Testament. Um, 
you know, the, what we're seeing is that kind of all these, all these different threads start to come together. Um, the, the Jews, we know, were wrestling with these things. They weren't, weren't quite sure how to put them together. When Jesus comes along and he starts saying, my works should be self-evident. And once you start seeing me, you should start connecting the dots. That these are the things that, that I am claiming to, uh, to be and to fulfill from all of God's revelation in the Old Testament and how I'm coming specifically now in the new. Let me close this in a word of prayer. <clears throat> our Father and our God, we praise you. We praise you for your Son who has revealed the glory of God the character of God. We thank you for your son that you gave to be with us, who took on flesh and blood, came in the form of a servant, was obedient to the point of death, and has now once again been raised and given the name that is above every name. We, we pray, Father, that we would uh, exult in your goodness in your revelation, uh, that we would worship you, that we would proclaim that there is one who has been given authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. And our, our task is to go into all the world and to proclaim him and to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. Uh, help us, we pray, to be faithful um, Strengthen us according to your power. We pray and ask in your name. Amen.